Hello everyone and welcome back to Cobain History. In today's video of Medieval Professions, we'll be talking about the uses of horn in the Middle Ages. I'm talking both about the physical horn of an animal, as well as the material which it's made of, which medieval craftsmen could utilize as a sort of medieval equivalent to plastic. This video will be split up in three main parts. So first I'll talk about the actual material of horn and how it was worked to create different kinds of items. Then I'll talk about blowing horns and after that I'll talk about the drinking horns. And as a bonus at the end of the video I'll also talk a little bit about powder horns and some other objects that are commonly made from horn. Before we start the video I wanted to give a quick thanks to Sam Arano, who you'll hear in a segment later on in the video. The term horner comes from Anglo-Saxon, and it originally could refer to both someone who worked with the material of horn, as well as someone who blew a horn. We'll start with the properties and uses of horn. Horn is a very versatile material. It is naturally hollow once it's removed from the bone core, which makes it an ideal shape for drinking and blowing horns. On top of that, Horn as a material is thermoplastic, meaning it becomes malleable when heat is applied, and when cooled down it becomes sturdy again. This flexibility allowed horners to transform horn into all kinds of different shapes, making it the plastic before plastic was even invented. And in fact, plastic did replace a lot of the items which back in the day would have been made of horn such as combs, buttons, spoons, small containers, or they could also be used as a decorative material in things such as bows, tools and furniture, among other things. It's also possible that horn may have played a part in the making of some sort of medieval glue. However, we don't know this for sure, but I wanted to mention it anyway. Horn has these special properties because it's made from keratin, this sets it apart from bone and antler, which are stronger but more brittle. Hooves, on the other hand, are also made from keratin, so they have similar properties to horn. So horners might have used hooves as well to craft their items. Hooves, as well as horn, could come from a variety of different animals. But for hoof, a horse's hoof would have been the best as a horse's hoof is one solid piece compared to a cow's hoof, for example, which is split. There is little known about the uses of hoof though, so it's not clear how often it would have been used in the Middle Ages. The availability and price of horn would vary depending on the animal it came from as well as the time period. But generally, horn wouldn't have been too expensive, and horners would have most likely procured their material from butchers and tanneries, or any other industry which dealt in carcasses. Some large types of horns could have been imported from other countries as well. For example, England was a large exporter of large bovine horns to the continent. There are multiple ways to work horn, it could be carved, worked on a turntable similar to wood, or it could be heated just above the boiling point of water, which makes it possible to reform it. With the solid parts of the horns, it could be reformed using molds or tools. And with the hollow parts of the horn, they could be split lengthwise and flattened between wooden boards. This flat sheet of horn could then be cut into circles or other shapes for making things like buttons or other small items. We know from combs that were found that when sawing horn, it is best to saw parallel to the direction of the grain, as this will make it more resistant to break it. The size and shape of the horn are the limiting factors here, so that made it so items made from horn generally didn't get that large. So that was the use of horn as a material, and now I'll talk about the blowing horns. One of the original uses of the horn still survives in the Jewish shofar, which is a ram's horn. This plays an important part in heralding the arrival of the Jewish New Year and the end of the Day of Atonement, collectively known as the High Holy Days. While the ancient Jewish temple in Jerusalem did have dedicated Levite musicians for important rituals, the shofar remains open to common Jewish use. 
and likely originated in an earlier time before worship was centralized around the temple. In the medieval period, blowing horns had a variety of uses, but most importantly was its use for signaling. These types of horns were used during hunting or giving signals to a large army in a battle or used by watchmen to signal alarm. Another profession that uses horns is the Hayward, which I have covered in a previous episode in this series. Generally, medieval war and hunting horns were crescent-shaped and would have been slung over one shoulder using a leather strap. When these horns were played, they were held with the wide end curving upwards in front of the blower's head, as this would broadcast the sound over the widest possible distance. These horns only played one note, therefore the various calls and signals were based on things like rhythm and speed. Now I'll play some of the sounds that you could have heard being made from a horner. These various calls could be used at various stages of a hunt or a battle to indicate to the participants what should be done next. The olifant was the name applied to ivory hunting horns, which were decorated with carvings. It is believed that these originated in Asia, however it reached Europe from Byzantium around the 10th or 11th century, and these types of horns later became a symbol of royalty in Europe. Medieval horns for the purpose of music were typically used by waits, minstrels and troubadours. There were three main categories of musical instruments during the Middle Ages, which were the wind, string and percussion instruments. Horn instruments fell in the wind category. Originally, the horns of an ox or ram were used as an instrument. However, in later ages, other materials were used to create blowing horns such as brass or other metals. Drinking horns are probably the easiest item to make out of horn. These are usually bovid horns removed from the bone core, cleaned and polished after which they can be used as drinking vessels. Drinking horns are known from classical antiquity, especially in the Balkans. The shape of a natural horn was also the inspiration of the riton, which is a horn-shaped drinking vessel but not actually made from horn. Instead, these were made of glass, wood, ceramics or metal, and these were also known from antiquity. In ancient Greece, there were two different terms for a drinking horn. One was karas, referring to drinking vessels made from actual horn. An other term they used was riton, which distinguished drinking vessels made from other materials. A right hand could have also had a secondary opening at the pointed end, which could be opened and closed to drink from, although not all of them had this feature. Horn fragments of Viking drinking horns are rarely preserved, but we know that both cattle and goat horns were used. Unlike the physical horns, a lot of decorative metal holders and mounds have withstood the test of time, and it shows that the drinking horn was widespread in the Viking world. Most Viking Age drinking horns were probably made from the horns of domesticated cattle, which would have held less than half a litre. For reference, if you want me to convert litres into drinking units, half a litre is the same as a pint, so these horns would have generally uh, held less liquid than a pint. But there were also significantly larger drinking vessels made from oryx horn, but these were the exceptions and probably also a status symbol. Drinking horns were the ceremonial drinking vessels for those of high status all throughout the medieval period. References to drinking horns were common in medieval literature. The Bio Tapestry, for example, shows a scene of feasting before Harold Godwinson embarks for Normandy and five figures are depicted as sitting at a table and two of them are drinking from horns. Now I'll talk about the powder horn which is post-medieval. 
Powder horns were used to carry gunpowder and were originally bovine horns fitted with lids and carrying straps. Typically there was a hole with a stopper at both ends. The wider end was used for refilling while the powder was dispensed into the guns using the narrow hole at the bottom, which acted as a funnel. In some cases the point did not have a hole in it and in that case just a scoop was used to scoop the gunpowder out of the vessel. The inside and outside of the powder horns were often polished to make the horn somewhat translucent. This was done so the user could easily see how much gunpowder they had left in their gunpowder horn. The use of animal horn along with non-ferrous metal parts made it so the container couldn't create any sparks. Horn is also naturally waterproof, which both are good attributes to have when handling gunpowder. Powder horns began to be replaced by copper flasks in the 19th century. Now I'll quickly go over some of the other items where a horn could be used in. Horn composite bows are bows made from a combination of horn, sinew and usually wood. Combining these materials allows for the relatively short bow to store more energy compared to a similarly sized bow that is just made of wood. Shoehorns started to appear during the transition from the late middle ages to the renaissance and were originally made from slices of bovid horn because this provided the right curved shape to guide the heel into the shoe and also had a smooth surface. Horns from various animals have been used for centuries in the manufacturing of grips or handles for knives and other weapons. And later on, decoration for handguns as well. Horn is also sometimes used in walking sticks or canes. Thanks for watching and thanks to Sam Arano for helping me with the segment on the shofar. If you are interested in Jewish history, you can check out his channel which will be on screen right now. If you're interested in other medieval professions, my link to the playlist will be on screen as well. I'd like to thank my patrons for their support, especially my $25 patrons Parker Dye and G. David.